Good afternoon. Now we start uh, the uh, afternoon session, uh, and uh, on this uh, I will build uh, on things I heard uh, in the previous day, uh, and uh, concentrate on personality and individual accomplishment. By personality in psychology, you intend uh, to uh, refer to a person distinct uh, and uh, basically enduring patterns of feeling, thoughts, motives, and behavior. Uh, to be better understood uh, by everybody that is not uh, into psychology particularly, I would say that uh, the personality is the sum of uh, our relationship uh, of interpersonal level. And also, not only with living person, uh, but uh, with the comics hero uh, of things that we see in the movie or in the theater, you know, but they are, you know, the sum up of the relationship. I have chosen uh, to illustrate uh, a vision uh, of personality that was created uh, by Carl Rogers, uh, which is uh, one of the fathers of humanistic psychology. Humanistic psychology is the psychology that put people at the center and uh, was uh, a reaction uh, of what uh, the humanistic psychology felt uh, that uh, the Freudian uh, and psychoanalytic uh, approach uh, to human nature was too mechanicistic and simplistic. Of course, it couldn't be other than a mechanicistic because at the time of Sigmund Freud that was the only paradigm available. And two, uh, mechanicistic for the vision of human nature that the behavior modification colleagues were proposing. So, uh, for Carl Rogers, uh, uh, the main focus uh, is on health, uh, not on pathology, and uh, uh, the theory of personality basically is bent on the positive and showing how people can, not automatically will, but have uh, all the potentiality to become a fully functioning person. What that means? Well, for Rogers, a fully functioning person is characterized by sound, healthy, uh, psychological, you know, uh, way of experiencing life, is open to experience, aware, in touch with their own feelings, are also able to be deeply in contact uh, with others and understand them uh, empathically. <laughs> the fully functioning person lives in the here and now, as opposed to somebody that is always alarmed, uh, that is uh, always ruminating at the future or the past, but they are present in the here and now, like also uh, the wise men uh, in our Western and uh, Eastern tradition uh, appear to be, are fully immersed in their experience, uh, in their phenomenology, and are capable of deep contact with their organism. Uh, organism means uh, for Rogers, uh, mind and body. There is no Cartesian uh, dichotomy. Uh, and able to symbolize uh, all their experience uh, without suppression and distortion uh, in defensive stance uh, and uh, are not restricted to condition of work or self contact uh, Let me explain better. It means uh, that uh, if I'm able to symbolize all my experience, uh, that I'm in touch uh, with all my experience. If I have the need, because I'm threatened by the experience, that they do not reinforce my self-image, I would deny those experiences or distort them. Let me make a very, very simple 
uh, example. Uh, for my self-image that I have derived from my parents and the culture, I'm a woman and I'm not really, but uh, let's say that I am, and my self-image is that I cannot be aggressive. As a woman, it's not proper. An aggressive woman is bad. So I feel aggression, but I would distort the feeling of aggression and I would project, attribute my experience to somebody else. Nila, why are you aggressive to me? Well, actually, it's me <laughs> aggressive, but I don't want to own it. If I'm much more in worse condition, that is called psychopathology, let's say that the sexual feelings are not something that I admit, because I've been taught that the sexuality is wrong. To feel sexual and sexual needs is simple. Well, I would uh, disassociate uh, that part of sexuality from me and I would hear the devil from the walls uh, tempting me with the you know, sexy voice or I would have hallucination of uh, you know, sexual images uh, as a temptation uh, to rob my soul. Could you just clarify the phrase fully immersed in their experience. Is this what you're talking about? By this? Fully immersed in the experience is that I symbolize without distortion and without denial every experience I have. I feel sexy, I feel sexy. I feel angry, I feel angry. I own my experience. Yeah? Uh, I'm not restricted by condition of word or self concept that means that uh, I'll clarify also those uh, <coughs> uh, points uh, that are, you know, if I have uh, capacity for self-evaluation uh, or I have introjected my parents' uh, standard, uh, my religion standard, uh, the society in which I live, or if I base, uh, you know, my compass uh, into my organism and uh, the natural morality that every organism has uh, naturally. So, fully functioning person are not afraid to make decisions based uh, on their judgment of the situation. I do it not because somebody commands me to do it, but not because I have to do it, but because I want to. But uh, Mila was referred to as a big sense, a large sense of agency. I live at first person. It's my life. It's my decision. And so, to be able to do that, there is a, a profound sense of trust. But it's not just a, you know, intellectual, cognitive. It's a, a felt sense. I feel it in my bones the expression goes. And uh, I feel a, you know, we call it Congress, a yet experience. I'm doing the right thing. You know, I can navigate and make a mature choice. I know that I cannot have everything. I choose what is most important. And I'm happy to have made the right choice. If I realize that it's the wrong choice, mistake, I'll change. It's not, you know, invested in, of say, I didn't make a mistake. I mistake and change. Uh, <clears throat> so, they accept uh, the fact that life changes, uh, there are up and downs, uh, and that they look forward uh, to engage with life uh, and be resourceful, use their creativity, and uh, uh, manage uh, and cope with change. Keep in mind that the Rogers, that was the first, uh, this uh, was happening in 1942, <laughs> when everybody around uh, was uh, proposing the biomedical, mechanistic, uh, reductionistic uh, model that there was focus uh, on disease, uh, not in health. So, 
Roger said, well, no, how come then that people have trouble? For example, experience the anxiety, which means threat. Well, they feel threatened when their self concepts are threatened, are not confirmed by their experience. Uh, so, for example, I feel uh, angry, but my self-concept is like it's being angry is not okay, and so I feel an anxiety and I defend and attribute to, to others. Uh, to others. When they feel that uh, their experience uh, contradicts their self-image, uh, they <laughs> feel threatened, uh, threatened uh, significantly, because in a sense, uh, if they accepted that they are not what they hold dear to be, they would have to die symbolically in that shape and form. So they defend with teeth and nails, you know, their self-image. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and so, the more you negate the reality of experience, and the more you feel anxious because you are threatened more and more, because the more you defend, and the more you feel you have enemies uh, around you. I'm not saying here that the fans are bad uh, altogether, of course. Uh, let me make a very simple uh, If I go on the medieval time uh, in the field of battle, I need a strong uh, defense, so I'll put an armor. But uh, to go back uh, to my castle, take a shower, if there was a shower, with my armor on uh, and go in bed, uh, with my partner with the armor now that can be detrimental to your health and you can get the rheumatism. <laughs> so very quickly, the same concept is a person perception of themselves and is shaped by their human ecology, with their human environment. You know. So, what Mila was saying uh, this morning, beautifully, better than I can say it as a psychologist, uh, is that the women uh, have been oppressed, uh, another minority, because everybody around them uh, has been uh, given a, a diminish, diminishing image of themselves. They could not be uh, happy about themselves. If you remember, I was living in California in the late 60s and 70s, when black people, rightly so, started to refuse uh, the violence uh, of being black uh, and both so being undesirably black. And they were, say, I'm black and proud. It had a lot of meaning, because up to then, uh, they were not uh, happy to be black. That's, they had introjected uh, a self-image uh, that from the majority, from the dominant culture, that was detrimental to their mental health. The same thing I was, uh, uh, you know, pointing out uh, to homosexual and lesbian. You know, if you believe uh, that uh, you are deviant and sick or even pervert, uh, and your religion says so, your doctor says so, the society says so, you believe it, and so you are really losing mental health and self-respect. Uh, so, these concepts are very important in psychology and also in Carl Rogers' vision because they are, you know, the point of reference, the frame of reference, the world that we inhabit. So, since uh, we are, as a mammalian species, a species that has a long neotenic period, which is to mean that the baby, to survive, it takes a long time of dependency, of the benevolence of the parental agency. You know, it's uh, at least uh, three, four years uh, that the baby cannot survive uh, on his own. In Italy, for some of us, it's about 35 years uh, that at 35 uh, we need our mother to iron our shirt. Very <laughs> Olympic games uh, won by Italy for neogenic time longer than anybody else. 
anche lì, ma non so much. Uh, <laughs> I teach at the postgraduate level, so I have uh, all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, majority of women uh, in our, you know, courses, uh, like this in everywhere in, in a mental health setting. But uh, it's true that they become, uh, you know, able to listen and help people suffering, but still they would not know how to iron a shirt because they are. <laughs> and, uh, so, what I'm saying this is that, you know, if you say that me as a man is unbecoming, uh, you know, the self confidence that, that I know how to sew a bottom uh, and uh, how to iron my shirt, uh, actually I'm creating a, a self image that I'm an handicap. That without somebody that does it that for me, I'm impotent. <laughs> So, again, uh, tomorrow in the narrative, uh, I will uh, expand a little bit more. So, when uh, I am not anymore in touch uh, with my organism uh, and uh, I need to distort uh, my experience, uh, I lose uh, my contact with reality, I lose uh, my compass, uh, and I become incongruent, defended. And, uh, so I defend them more and more, not in reality, but the phantoms that are in my mind and of my culture. That is not a good recipe to perceive, as I said yesterday, my needs and be able to satisfy them in a also socially harmonious way. So, uh, in terms of personality, it's clear that we all structure our personality inside the, the family culture, the societal culture, and the stereotype. Uh, and then the helping profession will the theory, and we saw that the will theory that they can be also very colored with prejudice and more or less helping people to become fully functional or not. Because, of course, if I have a theory and I project an image that, oh, your human nature is that you have the enemy inside. All you can have, also from me, the help is to, you know, elaborate a little bit the very destructive forces that are, you know, commensurated with you. Well, that is a sort of prophecy that is accomplished, you know. If my, you know, uh, expert to tell me that, that should be true. So, uh, there is always a, a dynamic, uh, at times even a battle, for what kind of theory of personality, for what kind of theory of therapy uh, uh, we propose. Uh, and so, the, Carrotter's work, I think, is uh, very significant uh, because uh, uh, the basic question I was alluding also the other day is we as professionals of mental health, let's ask uh, seriously, are we part uh, of the solution or sometimes uh, unwittingly we are part of the problem? Are our narratives, because the therapy is a narrative, narratives of liberation and self-realization uh, of narrative that, that uh, actually help the status quo, the injustice and the social oppression. As uh, listening to Mila to that this morning, you know, you have a, a clear answer, I agree. Women, not only women, uh, by the way, I think also men have been really oppressed in being a fully French person uh, and a minority uh, more than anything. But, uh, of course, if you give uh, uh, the image that woman, uh, accomplished woman uh, is uh, a mother and a good wife, uh, uh, of course, uh, you will not see tomorrow, I'm going to cite about accomplishment, if you see in science uh, and uh, arts, uh, on the last centuries, uh, you know, they are all male names uh, with few exceptions. Because women were stupid, not at all, but they were not allowed uh, to develop uh, their potentialities, and so forth. So, 
At the time, it was a very important uh, contribution. But unfortunately, I feel that still today we have to underline this process. Every helping profession is part uh, of the solution or unwittingly can be part of the problem. So I also need to ask myself uh, this question every day. <laughs> Rogers, uh, I agree with him uh, very much, uh, said uh, that uh, if we start uh, to help people that are suffering uh, and are uh, kind of insecure, confused, uh, just uh, by labeling them uh, with the psychopathology labeling, maybe that is not such a great help. Uh, maybe that would even contribute uh, to give them more problems, uh, not to find the better solutions. Uh, and uh, just an example, yesterday, but also today, a lot of psychotherapeutic approach uh, called their clients patients. But that is a label of somebody accepting dionysis and cure in a passive way, instead of eliciting the uh, empower, true empowerment, the, the active role, since that they have to live uh, their life uh, first person. Why to make a uh, dependent? Uh, when already they have uh, already so many fears to be dependent on. <clears throat> so, all goes uh, to what kind of epistemology you use, what kind of narrative. The epistemology of Carl Rogers uh, is grounded in trust of human nature, so it's optimistic. You got it. So, think about it. The professional, the clinician, uh, that uh, welcome a future client realize that he's a person and that is good news. A good news. Welcome. Because you have unlimited potentiality that uh, for many reasons and accidents you have not yet uh, fully developed. And I'm here not to cure you, but to support you in finding a way to actualize uh, your innate uh, potentiality. That's a very different uh, welcoming. That's uh, okay. Good morning, lady. Oh, you're a lady. Ha! Somebody with penis envy. Incurable. Do you want really to be welcomed like that? If I was a woman, I wouldn't pay money for that. But they were, were running because, uh, you know, the narrative of expertise that uh, you accept uh, the diagnosis. Like I accept that I use my mechanic and when I bring my car that is not something not working, I'm not saying, what kind of vision of motors do you have? And let me see if I share your vision of motor because your vision of motor function it would impact. Actually it's true. <laughs> it's true even in mechanics, okay? It's true in architecture. You know, the basic assumption that of uh, architecture are very important for the result that architecture is good at. So, this uh, citation I like very much uh, from Carl Rogers. Not as a scientist that, uh, you know, I approach, I relate it to a client. Uh, not as a scientist that, that uh, looks at the person like an object to study, like a, a little rat uh, in the maze, but as a person to another person. Of course, of the expertise that that uh, professor has. The profession feels uh, this client to be a person of self-worth. That is valuable because it's a person of value no matter what. What his condition is, what his behavior at the moment is, or his feeling. Meaning that uh, you have uh, to welcome the person, not the behavior. Not uh, his religion, not uh, his sexual orientation, not uh, his political stance, but the intimate essence of the person. That is just uh, already good medicine to restore the person to the uh, dignity of personhood. A healing social and politi political stance. Good medicine. So, he, the professional, respect the client for what he or she is and accept her or him as her and he is 
with all his potentialities. You notice that Carl Rogers, you know, the father of humanist psychology, in 1965, he was using only his, because at that time, nobody was self-aware of what woman liberation correctly noticed. How can I you put that over? How can I you say the Declaration of Rights of Man originally was formulated? Wait a minute, the women are the majority in numbers and it's the rights of man. It, oops, 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 oops. Language reveals the politics. Like we say, a dark desire. Wait a minute, I'm black, why dark is bad? A sinister uh, plan. Wait a minute, I'm left-hander, why <laughs> you put the blame on me? And so, and so, and so. And so, I'm repeating again the obvious that I hope today hmm. uh, that every approach to anything, certainly to mental health and to health, is based on the narrative, on the vision of the human nature. And uh, like I said the other day, the anatomic uh, you know, table of different approaches to medicine are dramatically underlying this. Chinese medicine, allopathic medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, everything is based on a specific basic human nature of vision, and everything that we talk about the nature of human being or nature of the world in which we live is grounded on value. Let's make the value explicit. <laughs> because a uh, uh, very big difference uh, results uh, by different narratives uh, or symptom reduction uh, or health uh, promotion or self-realization. Everything, religion, politics, philosophy, all is value making. Let's make uh, the value explicit, so people eat what is inside the food that they put in their organism. You know what I mean? Uh, <clears throat> so, it's not that, that in research, I think, uh, in uh, mental health, uh, we should uh, only measure effectiveness uh, uh, on symptom reduction uh, and uh, users of health care. That's either state or private insurance that uh, they measure success uh, on these metrics. I have the right metrics, I have the only metrics. I want to know if I help you to develop your food potentiality. And uh, if you were feeling a citizen uh, of second category because you are a woman, if uh, you feel I'm a woman and I'm equal to men, that has to be measured. If I was black and I feel proud to be black, that has to be measured as success uh, because it has even more profound impact of symptom reduction. It's the biggest symptom reduction. It's the biggest social cultural symptom reduction. So we think uh, mechanistically like every person is a monad, is an island, uh, you know, separate. That's not really it scientific and accurate. That is my position uh, uh, you know, in agreement uh, with the Rogers. So, every world view is always rooted in different value, offer different role models, uh, and uh, way of relating it. And this uh, uh, creates a vast difference of impact. If I tell you, I'm the expert, I tell you where you're wrong, and I give you the recipe how you should behave and think and feel, it's different that I help you to find your way. Because if I do you give a pre good solution, I would actually reinforce the, the notion that you alone can do nothing about it. And that you should be dependent also at the time when you're not going to see me anymore, but you'll be always dependent on expert eh, to tell you what is the proper way to live. So you are a girl, always eh, subjected to some father figure or patriarchal figure. We don't need to do that. And it's not cost-effective. 
is not uh, socially productive, is not uh, eliciting uh, the protection and promotion of human capital. It's also more costly. I just edited a book uh, on this, showing many ways it's crazy. Uh, so I think uh, that the uh, Helping the relationship community cannot afford uh, not to look uh, seriously in this kind of matters. And the fact uh, that uh, there is a lot of lack of attention on these issues, uh, on the values and the relation of politics, uh, uh, not only before Rogers' revolution, but it today speaks about the profession. Are we really a profession which means that, that we profess uh, to do our best in science and conscience but to always have our clients uh, or unwittingly we are not uh, really conscious but sometimes doing our self-interest uh, that we are not a profession but a corporation a guild like in medieval time where we keep our knowledge a secret uh, so we have a, a hold of the market the monopoly of the market? These are not a really nice question, but uh, uh, we need to ask ourselves. So, I would leave at this uh, point of this uh, input uh, start with another citation. At the basis of anything that a scientist undertakes is, first of all, an ethical and moral goal due to judgment that he makes. So let's talk square. What are your ethics? What are your values? What are you trying to accomplish as a profession? Of course, uh, we change now a little bit the subject matter, but not too much. You recognize the guy giving his a painting? Yes. Let's talk a little bit about personal accomplishment. Aristotle, in his Nicobenta Ethics, uh, stated that uh, great personal achievements uh, are facilitated by our narrative, our beliefs. First of all, that life has a purpose. It's not just a random happening. And that the function of life, the main function of life, uh, is to fulfill the purpose, our mission. Beliefs about transcendental gods, uh, I will clarify later what uh, that means, uh, uh, in terms of a sense of goodness, truth, and beauty, and beliefs uh, that individuals can uh, be effective as individuals. Of course, uh, it helps uh, if you live in a culture that uh, support uh, and sustain uh, and allow that. So, Aristotle, not a humanistic psychologist, eh? and that's very interesting. The humanistic psychologist that uh, created the humanistic psychology in reaction to the reification that was going on, but they didn't invent this concept. But it means uh, that these concepts were alive, uh, but were made uh, and suppressed or made minority over and over and over. Which means uh, also in the present time, uh, if uh, we do not affirm our value, they're going to be squashed. We saw the other day that the resilient people, we have tons of research, uh, are more capable and effective of price management uh, and uh, uh, you know that, that they are very creative. The psychologist uh, of humanistic uh, imprinting uh, have uh, all you know common denominator of uh, actualizing tendencies. These are all fathers uh, of the uh, humanistic psychology in movement. Maslow, that we cited yesterday, you know, and remember he studied famous men and women. <clears throat> and so that their life uh, had, uh, you know, 
common denominator and again Carl Rogers that put all his money on self-actualization. But the one that we say put all his money, I'm kidding. He designed, carefully designed hypothesis that could be proven disproven by research and he did tons of research, he and his collaborators. So we're talking about things that, that are being proven and not just in the 1942 when it started. The last, last uh, research results is uh, 2013 and pretty soon we published 2014. Because a theory, if it's uh, validated, never is true a theory, but it says that, that with the scientific method we say that it's uh, confirmed the hypothesis, huh? it's not truth. Truth is in metaphysics. Uh, but, uh, you know, with the tools that uh, you use to validate hypothesis in 42, you cannot validate hypothesis in 2014. We need uh, continually to check uh, our hypothesis uh, because thank God uh, or thank uh, man, technology of validating hypothesis progress and is more sophisticated. So, actualizing tendency means uh, that the individual, if it grows naturally, it grows uh, towards more and more autonomy. In Rogers, autonomy is to be free, to be deeply in contact with himself and others. It's never alienated and alone. Huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, for Rogers, I think, uh, that's important to underline briefly is a tendency that has a clear direction that is on, on all the living things. Now, it's very interesting because this was a revolution at the time. People, you know, almost took offense. But he was saying that the king is naked because everybody that didn't believe this for humankind, they believed that for frogs, for grass, for, you know, trees, <laughs> tomatoes, and only the human being should be, you know, the bad luck one that didn't have the inherent self-realizing tendency, you know, equal to a frog and to fully have inside her blueprint all the ingredients to reach a full frog attitude. So, the real, uh, you know, characteristic is that, like any other living thing, that we have number one imperative to fulfill our potentialities. And what is our potentialities? To survive, to love, to reproduce, to make meaning, to learn. You know, one thing that really uh, is the evolution of uh, humankind uh, is uh, this unquenched thirst to have uh, achievement. And that's from this uh, that uh, the motivation, uh, you will see it in a second, to great accomplishment. Gary called it rightly so because he's a famous uh, OD uh, professional. The, tendency to excellence uh, when they are organization is uh, embedded in our genes because uh, I feel I realize when I learn that when I do something with mastery you know a sense of aesthetic uh, of doing good ooh, ooh, a yes experience so as we saw, Aristotle uh, underlined this, uh, but also philosopher and uh, psychologist are in agreement uh, with him. Human beings get pleasure from the exercise of their skills and capability. And uh, there is Murray that wrote a famous book uh, that uh, says uh, the pursuit of excellence is uh, as natural as the pursuit of happiness. And it's pretty similar. Also, Hume affirmed that uh, 
the works of art uh, passed the test of time. What was art 1,000 years ago for a city the statue of us? Uh, Today, why? Because Parasitili had the capacity to sculpture marvel in a way that would resonate with us even today. It's the basic ingredient of human personality. It continues over the age. And so, this incredible capacity of communication, not that like with a spaceship, to communicate to another planet. But uh, me doing a statue now and uh, moving people's hearts, emotions, and uh, brains 2,000 from now. What an adventure. What an adventure. So, for Murray, I thought this is interesting. There, there are many four conditions uh, that are the common denominator that facilitate the great achievement in history. <clears throat> he got, uh, you know, a research uh, from uh, the early stage uh, of our past, a thousand years ago, to 1950, and in 2003 uh, published this book. He says uh, that this uh, what to give uh, really, you know, the Jews uh, the energy for the accomplishment, basically for uh, their sense of purpose, personal autonomy, organizing structure, present author, a transcendental goods, uh, as I promised at very time. The purpose uh, is a uh, sense of purpose is fostering a culture in which uh, the most talented people they live that life has a purpose and that the function of life is to fulfill that purpose. And in the autobiography, uh, Gary is always uh, you know, telling us uh, fascinating, he reads a lot of autobiography and uh, be curious to know he found this really sense of purpose. He said, Lincoln was a poor uh, guy in a barn didn't have enough clothes, but strong, rich, and sense of purpose. Uh, Stephen job, same thing. <laughs> Since accomplishment of excellence requires enormous level of work, so you have to have an enormous level of motivation. So you have to have a veterinary vocation is needed, you know. And it can be in history a belief that God call is for me to scientific or to artistic master. Even if people are not religious, they have a sense that it's their destiny, it's their human destiny to give a great contribution. Autonomy. A culture that supports and encourages the belief that the individuals can act effectively as individuals. We will say in uh, uh, Gary terms, individuality, protection, and promotion. Right? And uh, uh, so, nitty gritty, freedom, amount of freedom. Freedom from the individual and to be tolerated of being non conformist as uh, most of very creative people are, and think of Caravaggio, you know, they had to put up with the guy, but if they didn't put up, they wouldn't have this beautiful art work. Think of Michelangelo, you know, he was a tough cookie, but they put up, even if they were popes, and he had work of art, you know, forever. Uh, uh, so, for this reason, dictatorship uh, don't really promote uh, creativity. And uh, all the communities and uh, society and culture discourage uh, uh, individual initiative. Uh, in, for Murray, I agree, a culture that fosters individuality will produce uh, more individuality, so more creativity. The organizing culture, also this is self-intuitive, 
the magnitude the encounter or extreme of accomplishing a given domain varies according to the richness and age of the organizing structure. In the science, the structure from the Renaissance onward has been an evolving scientific method. In the arts, the structure present, present themselves different. Somatoform is the hyper, volatilism, the novel, the motion picture, all organizing structure. You know, if you didn't have uh, Lumiere Brothers, uh, you wouldn't have a film masterpiece, right? Obviously, you have to have uh, the technical support. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, some structure allow a limited range of elaboration, others are more allowing for diversity. Historical bur burst, you know, flourishing of creative activity are initiated by new theory, new styles, new technique, and the development of new instruments. Look at quantum mechanics. If they had an enlargement class, it wouldn't go so far, right? They would stay in the Newtonian physics. So, they were great discoveries, but they had the electronic eye to help them to go deeper. So, here it says, spectroscoping physics of the grand piano in music. And now, transcendental gods, what the Murray means by that. <clears throat> well, a well-articulated vision that, uh, uh, that there is uh, uh, a transcendental god that really relevant to that domain. Uh, we're talking about value, true value. The desirability of good, beautiful, uh, all the, what is uh, the central focus in science uh, and uh, in art. Uh, uh, without the value, science and art uh, would not be sustained uh, to reach excellence. So, again, for human nature, the value are the best energy. We're talking about petrol, we're talking about the hydrogen, we're talking about fixing the atom. No, the most powerful energy of all age is value. Think about it. Value has been energizing the humanity much more of any source of other, you know, energy. So, thanks, say, since it is an energy crisis, there is also a value crisis sometimes. So, this is me, not uh, Mary, but uh, uh, a co culture uh, that doesn't have this value uh, will not really achieve a peak of acceptance. A culture without a sense that science can reveal truth that will never develop a stream of scientific accomplishment. A culture without sense that beauty is real will never enjoy great epoch of art, literature, or music. Such artistic culture likely as Murray affirmed to be Aride and ephemeral. Now, I'm reminded that, that when I started many, many years ago, 35 years ago, uh, in La Jolla, California, at the University of San Diego, uh, my first training program, together with me, there was an old lady from Japan. And she was the head of uh, Tokyo Japan Women University. Uh, now she's dead, but I know her nephew. She was uh, dressing in a kimono. And then we became kind of friend. I asked her, why are you dress in a kimono? Yeah, we are all in t-shirts and shorts. Huh? You can be relaxed and we go to the beach. And uh, she explained, she was not offended, that her sense of aesthetics uh, uh, wanted, uh, you know, to dress in a kimono for her was a way to be respectful for that. 
and that I still moved by emotion, remember that uh, I was fascinated and I spoke more and uh, she, the next morning, said that this is a haiku, a short poetry, poetry in English, uh, that she gave it for me and uh, well, I was touched and moved uh, because uh, I was uh, fully aware and she was uh, Japanese and uh, we were not speaking even good English uh, even 35 years uh, later now, but uh, was uh, clearly the importance of this gift, uh, although I don't care very much for poetry, that uh, was uh, a precious gift uh, and was given uh, with me uh, that uh, the value was transmitted uh, across culture and uh, style of living. Fantastic. So, and Murray, I would say also that uh, yes, uh, his uh, first, uh, you know, his uh, inquiry cites uh, the best of excellence of old age. Galileo, Newton, Einstein, and Darwin for the science. Beethoven and Bach in music. Shakespeare and Schiller in literature. Michelangelo and painting. Uh, you know, if we didn't have the before uh, some uh, name of women, so famous women, uh, you know, you would see that here. Lady Montalcini, a noble part, Madame Curie, and now. They were still with it, they are not uh, capable of excellence. They were not allowed to the table of excellence to give uh, this precious food uh, for all humanity. But I would say, like Tommaso Akempis, they wrote uh, this uh, little precious book, uh, Daily Life, uh, a Spiritual Exercise. That is a similar in conception of the concept of karma yoga. You could have a high aesthetic accomplishment if as a fully functioning person you are in the here and now and you brush your teeth. You just breathe and look at you know, a blade of grass. Because a sense of beauty is really resonating deeply in ourselves. And so I want to give a tribute to these people that, say, Galileo Galilei suffered and worked so much for all of us and give their testimony, but also for the unknown millions that achieved beauty, walking in beauty in their lifetime and reaching the people that love and work with them. This is Darwin, Albert Einstein. And so, thanks to them, and see in the next century if we have many more women to display in a lecture like this. Thank you. Thank you. I think we, if we, if anybody would like to discuss, let's have the discussion first. Because it's too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The example of Albert Einstein that we can solve problems uh, the way we uh, created them. Um, I want to ask you about. There was also a slide about um, how we get part of the solution or how we get part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, what I want to do is a look at a mathematical perspective. Is this more an inclusive or exclusive or Should we, uh, can we have, uh, uh, could we just be part of both? Oh, I would say that uh, certainly uh, I'm sure that uh, in a lifetime we are continuously uh, uh, part uh, of solutions and sometimes part of the problems or even in the same subject matter in different days and different action of our lives uh, and you know I am uh, thinking that we don't have uh, one self uh, but multiple selves and multiple roles. What I was referring is as a mental health profession when uh, we propose uh, a vision of human nature are we part uh, of the solution or of the problem. 
then uh, it's a uh, one way because uh, you actually propose in a narrative of liberation uh, or of consolidation of the status quo. So in this case, it would be not possible to solve my own problems? Well, let's say you're black, and I think you're inferior. How am I going to be part of the solution? Here I'm part of your problem. And not only that, but that is a problematic. I believe strongly that there is no hanky-panky here. Either you are you know, in the society you live, uh, uh, offering, uh, you know, value that are life-affirming uh, and uh, emancipating or not. What I believe is that, that uh, I believe, uh, let me make an example personal. For example, in my institute, uh, I take proud, I was saying yesterday, that I hire just the same good people not regarding if they are women or men, but not regarding if they are heterosexual or homosexual. And I take a great pride on that. But I don't think that sometimes, unconsciously, not willing, I can, for example, hurt a person that is homosexual because maybe I make a stupid, defining remark and I don't have uh, the intentionality, but uh, that is a contradiction uh, of, of my behavior and hurts uh, just the same. So I think uh, that uh, also with the best intention, uh, sometime, uh, you know, and I'm saying uh, something that uh, I'm aware of so many other people prejudice that are not my own, but I'm blind uh, to my prejudice. And in 20 years, uh, some of my students uh, would say to me, look, Alberto Zucconi was a really good person and we tried hard. But then look in his writing how many bigotry there was and he was not aware. It's going to be probably this for all because uh, we, of course, uh, if we are aware of the things that people before us, uh, the previous generation were not aware, is uh, of course uh, very I'm not sure that, that I, but also Mila, you know, the woman liberation of, of 50 years ago is a ah, preposterous. She thought that, that with those words that she would solve the problem. Oh, she was totally black. It's uh, automatic. We always, you know, aware of what we are aware. And uh, every generation has been discovering unawareness of the previous. Uh, why should we stop here? So on that, uh, you always say. Uh, <laughs> the point is that you try to do your best, uh, sincerely try to do your best, uh, and welcome feedback uh, for people to challenge uh, your assumption and your belief and your value. I don't know if I answer your yeah, questions. Really good. And the second thing what I'm wondering about is uh, Carlos is very uh, prioritized the. the Given priority to the relation, the functioning relation between uh, the parents and the children, to so have a relationship, a good relationship, and on the other side, a good relationship between uh, marriage partners. But in our society, we have now very, very important problems, especially in high industrialized countries, where also in very under uh, uh, development countries where these relations are not functioning in a well way, are dysfunctional to the society. How do we, we deal about it? I saw a video on your Facebook account uh, to changing the lives in 60 seconds. Oh, of, so yeah, <laughs> of our parents. And, yes, uh, did you see that? Yeah, I see. But, and, and I'm wondering about if the theory of carbon is also is, um, able to apply for societies I'm glad that you asked because uh, I just mentioned uh, the work of Rogers in this uh, regard uh, health uh, uh, and uh, psychology. Actually, he was nominated from the Nobel Prize for Peace uh, because uh, we did a lot of work uh, 
well beyond uh, psychotherapy or education. We have, uh, I was present, we have uh, facilitated conflict resolution, uh, for example, in, uh, with the head of state and diplomats of the Contadora group of nations uh, when uh, Nicaragua became Sandinista, and uh, we had uh, for two weeks, uh, two different periods, uh, all the, you know, the United States and all the group of Contadora, and Carl Rogers uh, got the determination of the Nobel Prize for Peace. But uh, President Arias of Costa Rica got the Nobel Prize for Peace, uh, and he got uh, for the work uh, on the Contagora group and Nicaragua, blah, blah, blah. And uh, black and white in South Africa, Catholic and Protestant, uh, when they were throwing bombs at each other. So, uh, actually, uh, we've been, uh, uh, as the person said, approach, uh, quite active uh, in the larger picture. Uh, and uh, uh, if you read the books of Carl Rogers, like Carl Rogers' own personal power, uh, you see that his uh, stance uh, is uh, that you cannot avoid to be political. Even if you say, this is science, uh, we cannot talk about polit politics, that is a very political statement. So Carl Rogers was uh, very transparent and very political. He wrote in 1940, Six in 1949 and 1953, things uh, like uh, on uh, disarmament and uh, also well before postmodern philosopher wrote a, a book, uh, Visions of Man, at the time uh, <laughs> it was man, and uh, another famous article. Do we need the reality? I put a lot of that material. Then I make it shorter because, uh, rightly so, Gary told me that uh, too much <laughs> bibliography, and I agree. Uh, but if you want, I can send you this material in English. Also, maybe I think you get the question right in a way. Uh, short, quickly, question. How we can use the theory of Carl Rogers to establish good relationship between children and parents? between uh, marriage problems? Oh, if you go to our side, uh, you will see a lot because uh, we have uh, uh, what we call parent effectiveness training, uh, young uh, people training, uh, and uh, we work uh, with kids uh, from three, but I want to say how. Because we go back in the politics uh, of health uh, uh, promotion. We work uh, with Muppets, uh, with kids of three, because, uh, you know, the language uh, it wouldn't be sufficient, play therapy. And how we work uh, with kids, uh, we work uh, teaching the parents uh, and teaching teachers uh, that the problem with the school system is there are too many teachers uh, and too few promoters of learning. That what they have to do, if they really care about the welfare of their kids, it's not to give them anything, it's not to take away from them anything. Because kids already have it, they are healthy. <laughs> it's uh, parents' anxiety that uh, really assault their mental health and, or in, uh, in body health. So we tell people how scientifically proven they can uh, uh, you know, do their best uh, without damaging them, for goodwill, you know, of course, and no, no parents uh, do anything uh, for ill will, but uh, we teach people to respect uh, and trust uh, human nature. That's the best medicine, respect and empathy. Yeah, we do. We, just in Italy, in my institute, uh, we have uh, more than 500 training all over Italy, that the work uh, with the kids, uh, and we have uh, also some uh, uh, kindergarten uh, with the personal center approach, uh, where of course uh, you have to watch uh, that a kid that doesn't jump out of a window. You know, it's not the magic. Uh, you have to put limits, uh, but uh, you don't have to put limits uh, when they are not necessary. And uh, let me say just one thing: you now ask. I, speaking of Carl Rogers, uh, because I, I know I'm a pupil, 
But uh, I don't think it is the only approach or it's better than others. Uh, I am a Rogerian because uh, the value in this approach uh, are similar to my value. Another person has different value, this approach uh, wouldn't work uh, for her or for him. It's not that uh, I want to say that Carl Rogers is better than others. It's just that, uh, you know, when we teach uh, something, uh, when we say something, we always bring ourselves uh, nearly willy. And so I'm bringing me. And I'm a Rogerian because uh, the value of Rogers has similar to mine. I'm an optimist. I trust the human nature. And I think empowerment, that is uh, giving responsibilities. It's not a we, 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 magic. It fits also very well in touch to me because he says uh, the human kind is in, in, by nature good. Yeah. And, and how we how we get the back into us. Oh, thank you. A very short to respond. He does a very good example that is very simple, but I think an eloquent. Say, a potato has all the capability to develop uh, fully its potato ness uh, but has to have uh, a facilitating environment, some fertile soil, some rain, uh, you know, and some, some rain for photosynthesis. If instead uh, you buy the potato at the supermarket and you put it in your house, what you see after a month? that there is a monster potato, because the potato has done the healthy things. Their innate tendency is to put sprouts, but no soil, no sun, no nourishment, so they are monsters, they are pathologizing potatoes. But it's not that they are bad potato. it's just that they are doing the best they can in the circumstances. Did I answer your question? Thank you very much for your presentation. I especially like the phrase about the, uh, the language reveals politics and uh, the explanation of this uh, attitude to the term patient, which is really uh, understandable because its meaning already says that it's a person who suffers. And certainly it, it could influence that person and uh, the process of healing could be much more uh, difficult for the person. And my question is about uh, a sense of beauty. At the end of your presentation, you mentioned that it's needed for the accomplishment. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, what is the nature of the sense of beauty? Is it an inherent, uh, um, or can it be somehow developed? Or is it something similar to the sense of humor, for, for example? Well, uh, very intelligent question. I don't know if I'm intelligent enough to answer you uh, coherently. Uh, if I had to be honest, uh, and what the heck I'll be, I'm not so sure. But uh, my hunch, you know, about some of these things I'm pretty sure, but this is a hunch. And I'm telling you why. It's my observation, and also personal observation, you know, I don't go much in museum or that, but I'm hit in every, can be in Africa, and can be mother in a house, you know, there is a, a sense of aesthetic all over the world I go that hit me, and hits everybody. And that's what I call art, and that's what Murray referred, that the, and human, that the, the test of age is, a, that the communication is still effective across generation, culture, and age. And that's why we like arts from other cultures also. But what makes me not so sure is that if I see enormous uh, you know, effective communication through art, and I would say that also to some art with two films. I see also so much bad taste everywhere. People blind uh, to aesthetics. Uh, and actually, architectural you know, buildings that, that sometimes I feel 
I would condemn the architect that built it uh, to live in that uh, horrible uh, dwelling. Uh, and so I think, uh, like uh, value, they also entropy and the opposite. Uh, uh, we appreciate uh, beauty because there is uh, ugliness. <laughs> we appreciate the pleasure because there is pain. You know, if uh, there was uh, only pleasure, I would not be able to decode it as pleasure. If uh, wonderful music, uh, divine music, uh, wouldn't be interval with the silence, uh, it wouldn't be music. And so, I think, uh, like uh, in West Eastern uh, philosophy, this uh, yin and yang uh, are all the age uh, that, uh, not to be elitist, uh, at least I hope I'm not, uh, but uh, you can develop uh, the taste for beauty, but uh, some people definitely have innate. You can develop uh, the skill of uh, drawing, but some kids uh, are naturally born. I am uh, in other kind of arts, actually science and psychotherapy, but to relate to people is not only discipline, but also freedom, expression, artistic way of relating. And I see it. Sometimes, you know, I had a secretary, they have no university degree, and they're better, not of my students, they're better than us. They're more able to relate to people because they're naturally born, naturally, you know, empathic. And so, you can build on it, and neuroscience proved that. But also, some of us, unfortunately I'm not among those, some of us are gifted and they have it in their blood from the beginning. So, yes, you can develop, but if you're very lucky, you are born with it. I don't know if I answered your point. Yeah, thank you. And also, the attitude to beauty changed changes with the time, so something is considered to be beautiful in one time and nowadays like women's beauty for example, this is the, so the sense of beauty also depends on the circumstances or on the situation, or on the time we live in. <laughs> That's interesting uh, what you say because as I think of it, uh, it would, uh, you know, negate uh, what uh, Murray and Hume affirm uh, that if it's art, uh, it uh, is communication effective across the century and millennium. I think uh, what you say is obviously true. I'm, you know, witnessing. I'm an old man and uh, I have seen uh, what is beautiful and uh, I like ties, and I have a lot of ties. I have ties that uh, I bought the 40 years ago. Well, I don't wear anymore because actually I don't know why I like those ties uh, 40 years ago, but I remember where I bought it and I like it very much. But now the fashion uh, convinced me. And also this, I see also in tie or, you know, I'm not, part, as you see, not particularly fashionable, but I have things, you know, so when I buy things I try to buy something that's pleasant. And uh, I have a lot of clothes, uh, so I don't throw away things. Uh, but the some things, I don't know why they, I like them very much, uh, because after a while, the, I don't like them very much, because the taste change. But at the same time, if I wait uh, long enough, I like it again. <laughs> why? Because they, they kind of, yeah. and uh, something new. I don't know if uh, I'm uh, the only person that experienced that. A new fashion, I say, look at how funny, how stupid they even, you know. And after a while, the next year, I say, well, but after all, and after two years, I like it. I don't know if it's for you, it's the same. That's so, all. The, the cultural force uh, and the subliminal input uh, make uh, something to like or not. After all, as a kid, uh, I would never dream uh, to drink beer or wine. Tastes terrible, but uh, uh, you know nowadays uh, I wouldn't want to have a meal without some wine or some beer. I don't know if my answer. It, it's not really an answer. It, that's my pick. I don't know. Thank you.
The last before Gary, we don't have Gary, so <laughs> a quickie. I absolutely um, love your, uh, your question and your comment a little bit because um, I have a bias towards the question of aesthetics and I'm working with one of our other leaders, Winston Nagan, an amazing human being as well and an amazing, um, amazingly accomplished man, on, uh, on the aesthetic rights, of adding aesthetics to the human rights that is going beyond just the general um, entitlement to you know, enjoy culture and participate in it, but personal aesthetics. However, in a, in a self-critical movement to add complexity to what you're saying, you know, Gables was a, an amazing lover of art. <laughs> Gables, the Nazi Gables. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Gables was, a, and, and many of them, <laughs> then, I'm sorry, Google, so you say, but, but when you say in English, you emphasize version of you know. Yeah, yeah. So um, that he, thank God, I mean, we have a complication here. So your question about the role of the aesthetic in fostering self-actualization and by that improvement of character and sort of natural aesthetics of which you spoke about is uh, is very very intriguing. And I think the only way I can, once as you were talking both, and he came to my mind, and I'm thinking that this absolute Nazi leader was enamored with art, he was obsessed with art, yes, with the most refined taste, okay? Then I thought of when you spoke about value-laden everything. And then there's a, dare I say, um, crookedly developed or unevenly, you know, ticked over person, um, limping somewhat psychologically, if you have one, in them, one sense of appreciation without another. How can you divorce cultural appreciation from the one that produced that culture, from the human that produced culture? And how can you pantheon a human then you have a narrow sense of taste also? So you're reducing your own world by not being able to appreciate a greater span of things and, uh, and people. So it goes back to what you were saying, hold on a second, the, 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 end, the end line of anything such as beauty and aesthetics of politics as well as scientific claim will have to turn around and be again about the question, where are your values? And that will tip your own scale, your own boat. <laughs> In, in development, and it's a very, because see, the, the good old question of are humans, which is a, I find it a very erroneously posed question, are we creatures of nature or of culture? We're creatures of both, that's why we're human. It is our nature to produce culture, let's say it that way. So that the what we do with what we produce, very often you speak of, um, Gary and others have spoken of not wanting to be enslaved to the very tools that we have produced and means of, you know, technological. But we are creatures of technique, of technology and culture. That's what makes us human and in the production of that, unless we continually question our values and reinvent them and reestablish and revalue them, then, then we have a problem and we cause ourselves harm and another harm with the claim that I said before. I mean, you, you truly at the essential tr psychological and, and spiritual truth, you cannot harm another without testi t being a testimony to the hurt that was done to you or that you're, you cannot harm another without hurting yourself or devaluing yourself in the process somehow, limiting, stagnating or you know, hindering yourself in the process. So this is this is really amazing to me because you also spoke about tools and how we cannot do something without developing. We cannot even have new insights or expansion without first producing tools. Apparently we have a desire for greater vision. Then we produced that vision, that we produced prosthetic vision, we enhance it with a magnifying glass or a stethoscope or telescope or whatever it is, whatever tools we have. And then from there derive new things. So there's a process of, you know, constantly having outgrowing one thing onto the next platform um, or another. So there's this delight of polarity that you spoke, how can I know beautiful if I didn't know ugly? 
pain versus pleasure, that as terrified as some of us <laughs> have been over polarities, I am terrified of polarities. I'm, I'm appreciating in this contrast. If it were not for so, I would not be able to outgrow them. And when you outgrow them and rise on another level or platform, you are bound to encounter another heel, another set of polarities. Do you remember the, you know, the, the pace of things and the you know, setup? Is that even if you did not have somebody externally doing that to you, you will start doing that out of your own perception of the world. To feel the delight of overcoming them, and another polarity come to another realization. So they become multiplied in the process, overcome into something transcendent, but multiply as well. And in all of that, to me, was the, the you know, one of the things that you said that just really moved me in uh, how much you and Carl Rogers and others have put an uh, accent on human feeling for the first time, truly, not just diagnosing the feeling, but honoring the feelings. You said, you know, I'm angry, and I'm angry, and I'm going to accept it, and I'm going to look into it, feel it, think about it, and express it in the constructive way for myself, hopefully, and others. But to know now what we know, in which is this new understanding that the heart is another brain in the body, and I'm talking science, I mean, from three, so just three aspects. Heart has 65% neural cells in it. One more time, heart has over 65% of neural cells in it. What does that mean? It can think. You can think when your heart. It gives guidance. It actually communicates with the brain. And some of us who have experienced migraines in critical parts of, of our lives, on the left side of my meaning that my heart and my head were not aligned properly, it produces a particular hormone. And it also creates an electromagnetic field that extends beyond the actual boundary, the developing development of the skin and the body that can be registered. And if you want to look into that, you can uh, look up heart map. Heart map. Heart map uh, on, uh, on Google to see some of the research these people are doing globally. Thank you, Mila, for very rich uh, uh, comments. Uh, there is no more time, and so I pass uh, the mic to Gary.